This is lesson three for module five, the grid, part two. I have a lot to cover in this. The book does not go into much detail about the residential grid system, how power is delivered, and how residential systems tie in. I will talk about the residential grid, the delivery, and safety residential wind turbines, standalone versus grid tied systems, small commercial or residential grid tied systems with examples, load considerations, backup systems, and using hybrid systems, also basic system layout diagrams, grid tied terms, and a little bit about the smart grid. Then we'll get away from the residential grid and residential wind turbines and, and I will get to large wind turbines and wind farms. Talk a little bit about the nacelle, power generation, the service drop, power conditioning and conversion, the wind turbine transformer, a little bit about the wind farm itself, power collection and how it's laid out, uh, substations, and power distribution. All right, start off with the residential grid. I already talked about the basics of the grid, how it's distributed, uh, how it's how the energy is produced by hydroelectric plants, coal-fired plants, and we have an understanding that it goes to industries, usually three-phase AC, and then it splits off to single-phase lines. So we've already talked about the basics of the grid. Now we'll talk about how it's ran into the home. The residential grid, delivery. Power from the transformer can be sent to the home's meter by overhead or underground service cables. So we have the higher voltage distribution lines, the transformer, and an overhead service cable that would go down to the home. With underground service, we have the high voltage lines, the transformer, and the service cables going down conduit. It will travel underground, underground towards the home. High voltage extensions. It is sometimes cheaper for the customers to extend the distribution line overhead to allow for the transformer and lower voltage service cables to be closer to the residence. This photo shows high voltage lines being extended down the property line along the driveway to the residence. This is common in rural areas and installation costs are often at the owner's expense. So this person lives on a farm far off of the road where the main lines are so they put in overhead high voltage lines as an extension all the way down the drive to the home where the transformer would set. Also with this far of a run you would get voltage losses if you tried to run a lower voltage cable all the way down to the home. So a transformer being located here wouldn't be an option. pad mount utility transformers. Some residential areas have pad mount transformers. These transformers are for aesthetics and they also address some safety concerns. Just as with pole mounted transformers, pad transformers may power more than one residence. This one shown powers three homes. Newer technologies and designs for buried power lines allow for these transformers to be used. So the actual, the high voltage lines going to these transformers can be buried as well. The transformer is secured inside this earth tone case. The use of these transformers completely eliminates the clutter of overhead residential power lines throughout neighborhoods. So the high voltage lines overhead, also the service drops, like overhead service drops, all of that's eliminated. So you don't see any power lines in the neighborhood whatsoever.
Here in the US we deliver 120 and 240 volts AC. The transformer is a center tap type, so two of the lines are connected to the entire secondary of the transformer, so it gets all of the voltage, if you will. And any of the outer ones to an inner neutral produces 120 volts. Overhead cables, or service drops, enter what is called a weatherhead. It connects to the meter mounted on the side of a building, and oftentimes it's mounted to a small pole near the home. With underground service cables, the power comes up into the base of the meter by conduit meters. The older types used electromechanical induction, and they had problems with noise in the power lines. Readers also had to get out of their vehicles and carefully observe the dials. With the newer types, they are electronic and wirelessly transmit usage data to computers within the meter reader's vehicle. They also use modern measurement techniques to prevent inaccuracies. So the meter reader can just drive around and pick up all of the usage data. Meters measure energy in kilowatt hours, since appliances are rated in watts and not joules, which is the actual unit of energy. Here's an example of usage. A 1.3 kilowatt electric space heater is used for three hours total each day throughout the month of January. If the customer is charged 12 cents per kilowatt hour, how much would the customer have to pay for using the heater that month? The answer to this is somewhat easy. You just take the power of the space heater, which was 1.3 kilowatts. It is used three hours per day, 1.3 times three, and it's used for 31 days and that's a total of 120.9 kilowatt hours. And they're being charged 12 cents per kilowatt hour, so just 120.9 times 0.12, and you get $14.51. Tagging prevents opening and tampering of the meter base enclosure by unauthorized people. It's a special clip with its own code on it. service entrance cables. The typical service entrance cable, that is its brand in conduit, would be type THHN and there are other types. Another type used is the underground service entrance cable type USE, which can be ran straight underground without any conduit. There are many different types of cables suitable for service entrance and it depends on the application and codes. Here is an underground service entrance cable that is triplex. That means that it comes on the spool wrapped together in a cluster of three conductors, the yellow being the neutral. THHN would be very similar to this, but its jacket would not be capable of withstanding being buried. It must be put in conduit. You can see this jacket is very thick, and it's very resistant to weathering and rot. Okay, so now we need to talk about conduit. So you may know that is almost like a piping that you run conductors through. Standard conduit is called electrical metallic conduit, or EMT. It's also called thin wall. It is used for general purpose protection of wires and usually uses compression or screw type fittings. EMT is also easily bent. It's seen in cellar wiring, pavilions, and anywhere exposed residential wiring exists. Intermediate metal conduit, or IMC, is stronger than EMT and it can be threaded. Basically it has a thicker wall. Rigid conduit is used for strength as a factor and it's usually sold with threaded ends. Getting away from the metal conduit, there's also PVC conduit. It comes in two strengths, Schedule 40 and the stronger Schedule 80. PVC conduit is great for watertight applications since connections may be glued together. It is also easier to assemble. 
glue-on threaded ends are also manufactured for PVC. At the bottom there's a pre-bent 90 degree elbow. In addition to 90 degree elbows there exist also called LB boxes. These boxes provide a means to make quick non-sweeping bends. These are used on the sides of houses and buildings for incoming and outgoing connections in order to keep the straight runs of conduit close to the structure. The cover provides a means to pull the wire through during installation and that's because of the sharp turn that the wire must make. It may not make that bend very easily so you can remove this cover, pull it out and push it through. Here's an image of electrical metallic thin wall EMT right here on the side of a home. Power is ran from the meter with, to within the home to the breaker box's main breaker as seen at the top. These are the two hots. That's the two outer parts of the transformer's secondary. And here's the incoming neutral to the neutral bar. And it jumps underneath. You can't see it very well to this one. So these are both neutral bars. It's just splitting in half. So the two lines coming in electrify this bus, this bar and this one. So if you have a breaker that's a double pole, it grabs one leg from the outer tap of the transformer and the other half grabs the other leg from the outer tap of the transformer. So the potential between the two connections on the breaker is 240 volts because it's grabbing the outer lines or legs of the transformer's secondary, so it's the full 240. With a single pole, it's just grabbing one single line and a neutral is tied in. That would go to circuits needing 120 volts. This one shown up here with the 240 volt connection also has a neutral and that would be for devices that need both 120 and 240 like an electric range. And here's a breaker. It just locks into position on the lugs and there's a screw terminal that comes out of it. As you may know the breakers are for overcurrent protection. You've probably had them trip multiple times but they can also be used to feed power into a panel. In addition to the safety of having a breaker box to limit the current to each individual branch within the home, I, I want to backtrack and talk about the transformer fuses. Transformer fuses are put into place to prevent problems with the grid if the transformer was to fail. The fuses are on the high side of the transformer's primary, and it does not offer much protection in the event the service lines short together. Sometimes it'll pop, but I've seen um, instances where they've made contact with one another and the transformer just gets overheated and eventually explodes. Ground rods. Ground rods are made of copper or copper clad. For residential installations the ground rod is 10 feet. Ground rods tie the neutral feeder, residential safety grounds, and, and thus all metal cases to deep within the earth. This provides a path for lightning in the event of a strike and also a location to dissipate any faultily electrified devices or appliances. Disconnects. A fused disconnect is shown in this image and they are used to isolate power connections. They are used on heavy equipment without a means of unplugging. See, not all devices ha actually plug in, say, um, your central air conditioning compressor that's outside. There's no way to disconnect it uh, with a plug or anything like that. So the disconnect takes place of that, so you can service it. There are also pull-out non-fusible and fusible disconnects, and that's what would usually be used for an air conditioning. You wouldn't use this large indoor disconnect. residential wind turbines. So we've talked about how the power is, how it gets to the home, how 
it goes through the meter, how it's monitored, how it gets to the breaker box, and how it's divided up through different breakers for individual circuits within the home. Now we can get to how these systems are connected together and tie into the home. All right, so first of all, we need to talk about a grid-tied system versus a standalone system. A standalone system usually uses batteries as an intermediate storage medium for the energy produced by the wind turbine. An inverter is connected to the batteries to power AC lighting fixtures and small appliances. These systems are usually small and are not connected into the grid. The batteries can only be used to an advantage when they have been charged for a suitable amount of time. So you basically have your own, if you recall from the previous lectures, an inverter connected to the batteries and the batteries would be charged by the wind turbine generator. It's a very simple lower power system. A grid tied system may also use batteries for intermediate storage, but more commonly the usage of batteries is more or less for power outages. However, the turbines used usually produce enough power that battery banks would not would be an unnecessary expense for the most part. So you don't usually see battery banks for larger grid tied systems. A grid tied system usually connects to the home through the circuit breaker panel or load center. And this connection provides additional available current to the residents and thus the power availability increases. If the current being used within the home is not in excess of the production of the wind turbine, the additional flow is backfed through the meter and into the power grid for use elsewhere. A grid tied system allows for a reduction in the user's utility cost because of that backfeeding. There's a 10 kilowatt BWC Excel model, that's a Bergie has a 24-foot rotor diameter and it is mounted on a guide lattice or mast tower. At the base of the tower there is a tower disconnect and this is an outdoor fuse disconnect. This goes to a 10 kilowatt inverter which is in this user's garage and it connects to the double pole 240 volt circuit breaker within the load panel. So one of the spaces within the breaker box is being used to feed power into the breaker panel. There's also a service disconnect and net meter outside. As you can see this home has underground service cables. Monitoring and safety considerations with the tower has a fuse disconnect for the generator at the base of the tower. There's also a line surge or lightning arrestor. If the voltage is too high it will cause an arc so it dissipates the arc to the earth ground. There are also some that just store the excess energy. The tower and disconnect are bonded together and the tower has a copper cable going to a ground stake or ground rod that will help dissipate light straight to the ground rather than through the conductors and into the inverter within the garage. Here we see an inverter's display showing the generator's RPM, the line current, and the electrical output. So the RPM of the generator is 123 RPM, the line current going in is 5.8 amperes, and the output is 1.4 kilowatts. This grid tied system uses net metering, a special type of meter that is put in by the power company. It monitors the power being used by the home, also power being fed back into the grid and other parameters. Also near the meter base, there's the power coming in to the meter box and going into a very large fused safety switch. This provides a means to completely disconnect the home's 200 amp 120 240 volt service from the grid. It also provides fused protection. So there are large fuses within here as well.
loading. Careful consideration goes into the selection and site planning of a turbine installation. The overall cost, the return on investment, height limitations, power usage, and maintenance schedules are all part of selecting the proper turbine size. These details, limitations, and code requirements are discussed between the homeowner and contractor. This homeowner decided that a 10 kilowatt model. This homeowner decided on a 10 kilowatt model. It was within code, height specifications, and other requirements. Backup systems. Additional systems may be installed to allow a wind turbine or similar green energy system to have a backup storage supply. An example. In case of power outages, battery banks may be used to store energy from solar panels accumulated throughout the day, possibly in addition to wind turbine output. This allows for ample power during the evening, and especially for times when it is dark longer. Another addition to the system could be a natural gas, propane, or fossil fuel powered generator. This would usually be seen on a smaller system and could be used on a larger system in case of power outages. A hybrid system uses photovoltaic cells or solar panels in addition to the output of the wind turbine. Each of these 12 small panels have their own microinverters. There is a total output of 3 kilowatts for these 12 panels. There is also a solar thermal heating system at the right of the photo. And this just heats water for the residents. So here we get to the basic system diagrams. I'm not going to go in too far into how it's wired. Here's an example of a small standalone system. This small standalone system has a direct drive DC generator. This system usually has a 100 watt to 1 kilowatt maximum output at a low DC voltage. The small amount of varying power coming from the wind turbine is not suitable for most inverters, so energy is stored over time within batteries. These batteries act as an energy storage medium, allowing energy to build up over a greater amount of time. So after a day's worth of wind, it is ready to power the inverters for high demand in the evening for lights, small appliances, TVs, and other devices. The regulator portion ensures the batteries do not get overcharged. So DC generator, uh, controller regulator circuit, storage batteries, inverter, and a dedicated outlet or connection. Also these smaller systems require a controller to divert power from the generator when the output is not required. These systems must also have a controller to divert power from the generator when the output is not required. In other words, when the regulator disconnects from the storage batteries because they are fully charged. So if the regulator disconnects the current flow from the batteries, the wind turbine is basically connected to a no load condition. So the dummy load provides suitable resistance for the generator to charge. So again, say the storage batteries are full and the inverter is not being used, there's not much demand on the inverter. That means the regulator must disconnect so it doesn't overcharge the batteries. When the regulator disconnects, the wind turbine generator is no longer connected to anything, so it's not producing any um, flow because it's not a complete circuit. So the wind turbine basically free spins. It can speed up very rapidly because it's not under load. So the controller diverts the connection from the batteries to a dummy load to help slow it down. And this is common on really small, cheaper systems. Also, these systems uh, oftentimes have passive blade designs to prevent them from overspeeding. A braking system may also be used for very high wind speeds. Medium to large residential grid tied systems. Most medium to large grid tied systems have a direct drive DC or AC generator. The inverter changes the DC generator output to grid synced 60 Hz AC. The DC system may be used along with optional storage batteries. 
but this requires a regulator to do so. This, that prevents overcharging. The AC synchronous generator still requires a special type of inverter or power conditioning system to sync its AC output with the grid frequency. Most small to large grid tied systems connect to the home by reverse feeding through a single pole or double pole breaker within the home's breaker box. This makes the tie-in easy as long as there is an empty slot in the breaker box. The extra energy created is backfed through the meter, as, it, as with net metering, for most installations. You see the power is generated by an AC or DC generator that is fed to an inverter or, or power conditioning system of some type. Output is synchronized with the power within the breaker box and this allows power to be fed into the box which is utilized by the home and the household circuits and any excess is returned back into the grid. A system that uses solar panels to aid the wind turbine in green energy production is called a hybrid system. The special hybrid inverter used in the diagram has circuits to convert power from both the wind turbine and from the photovoltaic cells. Solar panels have a DC output. The wind turbine may be alternating current or DC output. The hybrid inverter may also be set up to be used along with optional storage batteries. It will condition the power and feed it into the breaker box similar to the other previously mentioned grid tied system. Rather than having one large inverter, photovoltaic panels often have their own individual small inverters. These are called microinverters uh, a while back in this lecture. When solar panels have their own inverters, it is not necessary to use a hybrid inverter. All inverters would just function separately, but would still tie into the home's electrical panel. For some systems, it is practical to have an outbuilding or garage to house components such as regulators with large inverters, controllers, fuel power generators, and storage batteries. This keeps all equipment away from the residence or business. This example is a large hybrid grid tied system. Grid tied terms. Power penetration. This is a term used to define what percentage of power in the grid is produced by green sources. Net metering. This allows for residential and commercial green energy producers to feed unused electricity back into the grid. And what I mean by green energy producers, that could be a homeowner that has a grid tied system. Net metering is a fairly simple concept. A meter indicates energy used from the grid as discussed before. Usually any power created by the wind turbine is absorbed by the home's demand and this usage is not pulled through the meter. So if the wind turbine is producing 2 kilowatts and the home is using 3.2 kilowatts at a given instance, the homeowner is using a net of 1.2 kilowatts from the grid. If this trend continues over the course of an hour, 62.5% of the overall kilowatt hour usage was provided by the turbine. This means the homeowner only needs to pay for the 1.2 kilowatts actually used from the grid during that time. If the homeowner is using less energy than the wind turbine is producing, the meter basically runs backward. Overall, the owner is billed only for the net amount they actually took from the grid. If over the course of a month the homeowner did not use more energy than the wind turbine produced, then the utility company would have to pay the, for the power fed into the grid or they would just apply a credit on the next bill. Power Purchase Agreement. This is a legal contract between a provider, usually an independent investor or companies, and a buyer, commonly a utility company without means or interest in producing alternative energy on their own. The contractual terms are usually 
five or more years. For the duration of the contract, the purchaser buys energy from the providers. This has helped numerous privately owned producers and the building of new projects. For the most part, wind farm projects are funded by these independent companies looking to invest in cleaner alternatives. These companies are not a part of utility companies and are often called independent power producers. As you may recall, a certain portion of green energy must be bought by utility companies and they must pay the providers a fair share for the clean energy they produce, and that is called a feed-in tariff. So we talked about the grid in the last PowerPoint lecture. Now I'd like to talk about the smart grid. Switchgear operation, reclosing of circuit breakers, and other manual operations at substations are now encompassing systems to allow for complete remote control. Remote terminal units, or RTUs, utilize wireless links to establish communication with utility companies and other devices. These RTUs can also communicate grid conditions to other devices within the grid to perform tasks such as fault detection and information on power. So here we see two power line reclosures. They look like transformers. Their condition is relayed to the RTU. The RTU can monitor and send out data on the conditions. So as an example, if a circuit breaker opens due to a fault, the signal indicating the fault is relayed to a control center. And if equipped, the system itself would completely isolate the specific area that caused the fault. This would allow power to be routed around the fault so some systems could have power restored quickly. The grid has undergone continuous infrastructural improvements in recent years and as more monitoring and control systems are used, it will grow from a passive to a more controllable and efficient active system. So in the drawing, here's the substation transformer. There are RTUs on the switch gears, ring main unit, and possibly other devices within the substation. Also, sectionalizers have their own RTUs, and all of this information is sent to the monitoring and control side where it can take action with little or no input from personnel. All right, so getting away from the grid, residential systems, go into the large wind turbines and their systems. You see here in the photo there's a collection of large wind turbines and IPP has contracted the installation and connections of these towers and they monitor their output into the grid. These large systems are of course called wind farms because they are harnessing or farming the wind for energy production. I talked about this before. Uh, the wind turbine nacelle houses the generator, uh, gearboxes, other things. Uh, we're focused on the power production within the, the nacelle, so we'll take a look at the generator. It also has a forced air cooling system and nacelle control cabinets. From the generator, there are stator and rotor cables, and there are three phase AC and they go down the tower to the base. See here at the down tower level, at the very bottom of the tower, the cables are coming out of this protective case. They will go into the top of the DTA, the down tower assembly. Since the cables are three phase, they are 1.2 kilovolts from line to line, and they are 690 volts from any line to a neutral and that is a fairly common voltage for these larger one megawatt or greater turbines. So the stator and rotor connections from the generator go into the DTA for this system. All the large power conditioning systems are within the base of the tower. Here we see the outside of a down tower assembly and it houses the power and control systems. Here on the inside we see the stator and rotor connections within the DTA 
the DTA also has the power converter bridge that consists of phase modules. These phase modules use large IGBTs, which is a type of transistor, and it's used for power conditioning and conversion within a certain section of the DTA. This DTA is a very large cabinet. The converter bridge is used in conjunction with internal transformers, inductors, and capacitors to ensure the power produced is synced at the same frequency as the grid. The modules have losses in the form of heat and are water-cooled. You see the lines coming into the module. It's similar to a heat sink within an amplifier or also somewhat like a radiator in an automobile. This particular DTA power control cabinet also houses a main controller circuit, a fiber connection to relay turbine condition to the wind farm O&M facility, and a patch-in communication terminal for techs to monitor and collect data while at the bottom of the tower. It's also possibly for servicing and shutdown. Various proprietary microcontrollers and other circuits and devices exist within these very advanced power conversion systems. This photo shows a few power disconnects within the down tower assembly. Power from the generator is ran down the tower into the DTA. The DTA converts the power from the generator into grid synced 60 Hz 3 phase AC. This conditioned power is then sent to the wind turbine's pad transformer. This transformer connects the power at the correct voltage for the underground collection cables. The power within the generator is controlled and conditioned in the DTA. That power is then fed to the transformer where it is stepped up for the underground collection cables. This drawing shows the basic layout of a wind farm the buried cable pathways from the towers are highlighted in blue, overhead lines are in red, county roads are drawn in black, and access roads are shown in gray. If you read through the document pertaining to the California Ridge Wind Farm permit application, you would see these maps. So you may want to take a look at those. You can see there are multiple towers and the county roads passing near them. There are also access roads that go to each tower and the collection lines and this would include fiber cable and the power from the turbine goes to the substation where it is all collected. It is then stepped up and sent by overhead cables to the point of interconnect where it is then distributed to other areas. So with all the towers in the wind farm, only the overhead transmission line from the substation is seen. All other lines are buried. The incoming collection line at the substation. At left there is a conduit riser. It brings the buried collection lines from the towers up from the ground. The lines are connected to breakers shown in the background. At right, most of the conduit risers are shown, and also one of the numerous breakers. Notice how all metal structures have ground wires and metal grates. These breakers provide protection and a means of isolating sections of the wind farm from the substation. The yellow box indicates the incoming lines from the risers. Power cables leaving the breakers, shown in orange on the left photo, are paralleled together by overhead buses. These buses are basically aluminum tubes cut on site during construction. So the buses all tie together and they run to the grid distribution transformer. This is a generator step up transformer or GSU. This very large transformer ties the power generated from numerous turbines to the grid. It must be designed to withstand large changes in demand. 
These transformers have large cooling systems to prevent overheating caused by the quick changes in power demand, grid switching, and load rejection. Careful control of the core materials is a requirement to ensure it continues to operate safely and effectively. Note the cooling fins and fans. The grates below are covering a pit. This is for the coolant oil to drain into in the event of a catastrophic structural failure or leak. You see the lines coming from the collection bus into the transformer's primary and the secondary is a stepped up voltage that is at the correct voltage for the grid interconnect. The GSU is not directly connected to the transmission lines. There is a high side gas breaker and the breaker provides fault and a means of disconnect between the GSU and the grid's overhead transmission lines. It uses sodium hexafluoride gas contained within the cylinder here to prevent volatile internal arcing between the contacts when they Open quickly in the event of a transmission line fault. Also after the gas breaker there is the transmission line switch. This makes or breaks connection to the overhead three phase transmission lines. Also below the transmission line switch is the substation's output metering system. It uses current transformer to monitor how much current is flowing out into the grid. That indicates the power being used from the wind turbines. Here's a quick overview of the basics of a wind farm substation. The risers bring in all of the buried cables from all turbines, which may be miles away. The power cables from the risers go into breakers. From the breakers they go into the overhead bus which collects all of the power from the wind farm. It then goes to a, a monitoring area to a switch, from the switch to a breaker, from the breaker to the GSU, and the GSU steps up this voltage through a gas breaker that protects the GSU if the transmission lines were to short out. From the gas breaker it goes uh, to a short bus line to the metering system. From the metering system up to the transmission line switch and finally to the transmission lines that travel to the point of grid interconnect. Here, maintenance technicians reconnect the section of the wind farm back to the substation. The portion of the wind farm being reconnected had been disconnected for safe servicing of the turbines. This wind farm substation also houses power correction devices. Turbine monitoring equipment. Also ran alongside the collection lines are data cables using fiber optic cables. They provide real-time data from each tower and also provide a connection to control the tower remotely. The fiber cables are seen coming into the substation and underneath the walkway to the substation building. From this building a data link goes into the nearby operations and maintenance building where the careful monitoring and control of the wind farm is performed transmission lines, towers, and poles. For this wind farm, some overhead transmission poles are not wood, they are steel. This is so the poles required to change power line directions will not need diagonal guide cables and earth anchors, which require large clearances on the ground. These steel structures are more rigid against the pulling forces of the heavy links of power lines. All poles are grounded to dissipate lightning strikes and faults. So here we see the 3.5 to 40 kilovolt volt, uh, power lines coming in from the turbines, going through the breakers, buses, the GSU, and so on, through the switch. The transmission lines are usually 100 to 150 kilovolt lines, and they go to the point of grid interconnect. The wind farm substation is in the top photo at the far left. 
This substation currently collects power from the wind farm's 134 turbines for a total of about 200 megawatts of peak power. The grid switch tower is seen near the center. The overhead transmission lines are at far right. The overhead transmission lines deliver power from the substation, usually at a central point of the wind farm, to the point of interconnect, as seen in the bottom photo. The point of interconnect for this wind farm is at a nearby decommissioned coal-fired power plant. Since the power plant ha has long-distance transmission lines already installed, power from the wind farm can be delivered to areas far away. Some basic terms for this lesson, though we went over a lot. Feed-in tariff, net metering, power purchase agreement, hybrid systems, residential systems that stand alone, grid-tied systems and hybrid systems, wind collection substation, the wind farm, and what a disconnect is. We don't really need to worry about delivery to the home, the conduit, different names for the conduit. Um, that's just an introduction to what we deal with in residential installations, and that will be covered in later courses. You need to complete the reading if you haven't already. Also, there is a check for this module. There is a quiz over this lecture and the reading, and also this week, the test for the entire module.